So the topic tonight really, really is one that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, is my audio okay back there? Okay. So tonight, it's a topic that I've been thinking a lot about for a while. I've talked it over with a few people and, and kind of my crazy ideas on what to do, and, and they were all pretty intrigued by it. So I thought I'd put it together in a presentation. Um, we tried it out with about the last three clients we built websites for, and they, the response has been absolutely phenomenal. So um, uh, I'm going to share this with you, and it's going to be kind of cool. So uh, building a website so a marketing person can manage it. Now, if you guys read the meetup thing, you realize I'm not saying that marketing people are dumb. I'm saying they don't know programming, which is okay. We want to build it so you don't have to understand the web. You just need to understand your job. Uh, we who are developers should be building it. So if any of you guys are marketing type people in here because you got confused, um, I'm not going over how to market things. I'm going over how to build sites for marketing people. Um, so who am I? I am the uh, senior developer here at Level 10 Interactive. I've been with Drupal. I've been using Drupal for about five or some odd years now. Uh, I, I got into it because I was looking for a good CMS and found it and haven't looked back since. So. Um, there's my uh, email address if you want to email me. I am a frequent itch scratcher, meaning that I go on Drupal.org mostly when I find a problem in something, and I'll figure it out, commit, contribute a patch, contribute a new module. We actually just made a new module and contributed it on Thursday because there was something, I'm going to go over it, that uh, was, we were trying to figure out a non-hacky way of doing it, and we found a really, really great way of doing it. So um, it's one that I highly recommend if you've got this type of a problem when I get to it. So I'm also a big fan of running, woodworking, and gardening. I'm really excited, number one, because it's spring and the gardening's coming around. Or it's all, you know, I'm, it's time to get ready for spring, but also my foot's finally healed so I can run again. So, so what's so hard about Drupal? This is kind of the, the big question. Well, it's really designed around a programming paradigm, right? And which increase, increases your complexity and confusion, and sometimes you end up with really hacky solutions. This is really kind of, for me, encapsulates what's wrong, what, what can go wrong with it. So we're going to try and mitigate these points. Um, specifically, uh, many of the features are developer-centric. You look at panels and context and views. These are really geared around problems that programmers have, but not so much end users, right? They, they, you look at views. It's a way to query the database and display results. It's not something that normal people deal with. That's something that programmers deal with, right? Um, there are many options when configuring settings. Has anybody in here used panels? There's a lot of little pieces all over the place. You've got to walk through 20 steps in a form to get there. You know, it can be very confusing if you don't really know what's going on. So there's a lot of complexity involved. There's dozens of ways of accomplishing the same task. How many ways could there possibly be to put a block on a page, right? So there's that confusion. There's also a dozen ways to create pages, right? You can create a panel page, you can create a view page, you can make a node, you can make a, I mean, a custom thing. There's tons of different ways to do it, so that leads to confusion as well. And finally, developers tend to build the easiest way to implement things, and often this ends up with very hacky solutions. So, um, and that works initially, but then things get worse and worse and worse, and we tend to go a little overboard. So, the first thing we need to look at is to be goal-oriented, not programmer-centric, right? We need to see what are the end users trying to do with this site and then go from there and build it around our end users. Um, every decision in the site design should be based around what the end users are doing to try and make their job easier, not to figure out what kind of tools we have or, or you know, what the easiest way is. And also, um, what tasks are they going to be frequently doing and make that easier to find and easier to do? So how do we do this? Well, first of all, use Drupal 7. If you're thinking about making your Drupal 6 site, forget it. You're not going to make it user friendly. Um, that was one of the biggest feedbacks about Drupal 6 was people just, it, it was very, very confusing. If, anybody have ever, have, if any of you have ever watched the usability studies that were done on Drupal 6, it was embarrassing. Anybody watch those? They, they, they'd ask a question, they'd have somebody sit down who'd never used Drupal before, sit at the, at the screen and say, all right, create a node or create a page. And they would sit there for five minutes trying to find the little create content link 
and could not find it. It was amazing. It was embarrassing at how bad our usability was. Well, they did a whole bunch of studies. They hired Mark Bolton, some usability people, did a ton of work. And that's where we get the uh, admin and shortcut toolbars in Drupal 7. We get the overlay. The, a lot of the links have been rearranged. Can anybody figure out how to get rid of the um, submitted by stuff on nodes in Drupal 6? That was impossible to find. It's now possible to find in Drupal 7. It's right where you would think it would be. In Drupal 7, it was hidden in some ridiculously hard to find place. There's a lot of that stuff that's been fixed. So step number one is use Drupal 7. Do not use Drupal 6 if you're looking for, you, for a marketing person. Number two, remove all distractions that you possibly can. Um, I'm going to show you a good example of this. Um, but a big part of that is to use your roles and your shortcut bar. Um, I'm, again, I'm going to show you this, but one of the things, if you install admin menu, and anybody in here use admin menu? It's great drop downs, adds a whole bunch of stuff to your site, makes it easy to find your admin navigation. But, what's that? Oh, but if, if you hand that over to a marketing person then, and they've got all that stuff in there, they're going to panic. Right? There's just too many things for them to click on, and half of them will break the site. So uh, we want to remove all of that. So let me um, pull over here, and we'll look at this site. Right? So I've got all of these options up here. This is the default Drupal's um, toolbar, so I can go to my uh, different admin pages. And there's all these different features for them to click. All right, this is the default admin. I've created a blog user in a blog role. So if I log in as them, so this is my marketing person, right? And their primary job is to create blog posts and administer other people's blog posts. Now what do you see at the top? Four things. I could even get rid of the first couple ones because there's add blog posts and administer blogs, right? I've removed all that other distraction that's going to freak them out because they don't really need to see it, right? We need to focus them in on the things that are their jobs. Now, with Drupal and the roles, it's very easy to um, segment all these roles, and you don't want to go crazy overboard depending on your organization, but you can create your blogger roles, you can create your marketing roles for landing pages and different things like that and then assign the roles to each person, and then each person sees the different pieces that they need to see, and it doesn't get crazy confusing. Yeah, so that's, that's the first part of that. Is there any special modules you need to do that? Or that These are in core. These are already in core. So let me log back out. So in core, if I go to like the structure page, up here is this little plus bar. If you're, it's, it looks a little bit different in the default theme, which I can show you, but um, it says add to default shortcuts. And that's where I, if I click that, and then there it is right up there. So any of the admin links that somebody's going to need to access, you can add up to that bar up there and customize it per role or even per user and say, here's what this user needs to see. So it's very important to do that kind of stuff. Um, Uh, so, remove distractions, use the roles, and then create admin views is another one. Um, most people don't really like the default content stuff because it gets, gets kind of confusing. If you have, a, 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 again, a marketing person and you say, go to the content page to ma manage blog posts, well, depending on what's in there, there could be tons and tons and tons and tons of stuff in there, right? You could have your landing pages, your nodes, your... Um, your front page slider images, have all this other stuff in there, and they're going to have to hunt through it. Well, you can create these, like this I've created, there's called Administer Blogs, um, and this is a view that's designed to look very much like the WordPress admin. So we've created a very nice view that only shows blogs, and that way they can see just the information they need at the time that they need it. So those are another thing you can do to help quite a bit. Yes. You're saying remove distractions. Why don't you have a, a left-hand panel that just shows exactly what's right there? 
because you said all I got to do is go to the structure, but there's about ten things I wouldn't know to go to the structure about first. You mean you mean uh, this stuff right here? No, I'm saying keep your on the left panel what you're trying to tell us. Put that where they could click that and do exactly what you're saying. You're saying go to structure and then do something else. I think oh. there's distractions in what in, in even on that right there. There are. I'm. I'm, I'm talking about when you're trying to customize for a specific type of role so that, like say we have a blog administrator, we can create, we can remove the distractions from them for that so that when they go in here, they're going to click administer blog and this is what they're going to see. And these are the tools that they would need to see to administer blog as opposed to having, when I was logged in as the, other, as the admin user, I saw a ton more stuff along the top. Well, I am now. I see all that other stuff up there that's going to confuse them a bit. Sure. That's what he's about. Yeah. It, well, the, and and I guess the point is, there's a certain amount of training as well that goes along with it. I mean, you know, you're still going to have to show people this. And if you've, you've wor if you used WordPress, this should be fairly familiar. Otherwise, you know, you've got edit this blog post, trash this blog post, view this blog post. You can see what tags and categories it's assigned to. So I mean, is there more user usability you can add? Yes, but. Trust me, this is better than it was. Okay. So, um, so the other thing is use the Rubik and Tau theme. Yes. When you say create admin views, is that through the views module? You can, yes. Or, or you're just saying in general create views for the administrator. Uh, you create views for the administrator using the views module. Right. So segment off different pieces of your of your administration for each specific role is kind of what I'm saying. Okay. So use the Rubik and Tau theme. Um, Instead of the default seven theme, it adds a lot of nice customizations to it. Um, I can actually show you the difference. This is the Rubik and Tau theme. You see the top bar. You can't see all the little subtleties in it because of the projector, um, the nice gradients. This one is the default seven theme. It's much more plain. It's much more boring. It doesn't have a lot of the, the, uh, the features that Rubik and Tau does, right? It's, it's a lot less there. Um, uh, most of the people that I know that are, that are power users use Rubik and Tau just because it's significantly better. It's kind of what anybody who upgrades that uses. So use that as an administration theme. Um, now we're going to get into some of the more fun stuff. Simplicity. This is use any um, usability improvements that have been made due to end user testing. Now Drupal 7, I said, was a major improvement on Drupal 6, but there's still a long ways to go. Um, you may have seen, there's, they've already been doing a lot of usability studies on Drupal 7, and um, people are doing much better. It's not as embarrassing, but it's still not quite as good. There's still some things that confuse people. So, um, by you, in Drupal 8, we're working to improve all of those, and there's backports of a lot of that stuff that we can incorporate into our code, and we also can stay away from overly complex modules. It'd be nice if Chris uh, Vanderwater at Eclipse GC was here because he would be disagreeing with me on just about every point I'm about to make. <laughs> um, so there are certain modules that we developers love, um, and they work really, really, really well. If you're going to be the person managing the site, absolutely go ahead and use them. If you're handing it over to a marketing department, don't use them because it will confuse them. So how do we do this? First of all, we need to use the uh, UX improvement modules. These are some of them. These are some of them that I really like. Um, there's the backports module that backports some of the, some of the stuff. Um, there's one of them that's absolutely essential is simplified menu admin. And let me show you what that one does. Um, in normal Drupal, so I've got two installs here. One is um, um, my improved Drupal and one's normal Drupal. When I go to menu, if you notice, one of the things that really confused people is you've got list links and edit menu and then add link, right? right? A lot of people, if you said, if you want to modify the links that are contained in the menu, what are you going to go to? And they would think, oh, edit menu, right? It's in the menu. Well, you click on edit menu, that doesn't make any sense, right? 
So what, what this does, what, what that module does, is it fixes this problem. Let me show you. Instead of having that list links and then edit menu and then add links, there's only one. It's only edit menu and add links. So if I click on edit menu, it has both the name and the links down below. So it combines those two operations together, which was really confusing people. So that's a good one. And marketing people often need to modify all the links on your site. So that's a very important one, right? Um, another one is simplified menus. Now we are simplified modules. We've gone back and forth on this. Does anybody, about, anybody have trouble navigating the modules page to try and find one to turn on and off? It's really hard, right? This simplified modules is one way to do it. And basically what it does is it takes <coughs> all of the core modules and leaves them alone, but all of the contributed modules, it takes away all those field, there are all the sets and combines them all into one and alphabetizes them. Now that's really cool sometimes, but we've kind of started turning it off again. We don't really like this one as much as we used to. Because there's a lot of times when a module will come in a set of like five different modules and it gets really hard to turn those on because now you've got to find, it, especially if you don't know the module well, you don't know what came with it and what goes together in the nice, nice little set. So we've started turning this one back off because it is confusing. Uh, simplified modules, we do not anymore. G give it a try and see if you like it. Otherwise, eh, turn it back off. Uh, there are some advantages, but we, we are choosing to turn it back off again. As a, As a marketing person, it might be nice to have it on. It have a oh. No, it does not. It does not have a toggle to turn it, switch back and forth. Um, yeah. <laughs> Now in Drupal 6, they had uh, several other modules where you could um, uh, filter them. It would collapse all the field sets, and then you could start typing the name of the module, and it would start showing it. There's some of those. I don't think they've made the port to Drupal 7 yet. I, is there? Module filter. Module filter. I don't really like them all that much. Um, you can do the same thing by hitting Control F and start typing the module name. So I mean, <laughs> it's half a dozen in one. Apple. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to find it. Um, the, a lot of these have come out of the Drupal Gardens thing, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. So I kind of pulled out a lot of what they've done to share that as well. Um, options element takes the basic options in field, the CCK fields and whatnot, and makes them better so they're easier for people to manage. Instead of having a big text box where you put key, um, uh, pipe, and then value for everything. It actually adds these nice JavaScript widgets where you can put the key value in and another field for the value and, and make it all nice and pretty. So it does a lot of really cool stuff for people who are managing that. Because then, uh, let me see if I can actually show that. Um, not generally. I mean, we can't, we can't forbid them from doing it, but um, generally, they ask us to do that. Um, oops. Let me get this right. I'm going to do the blog one. So if I have like a... I must not have that enabled. What's it called? Already enabled, OK. Uh, oh, you know why? Because I, I think it's, oops, text. List. Still getting used to the new Drupal 7 stuff. 
Um, so if I create a select list in my site now, um, instead of having, uh, it's not doing it for some reason, but you know, usually this is what you see right here where you have the, you type in one um, and then first and then two second. Well, it changes that to be a lot prettier. I'm not sure exactly why it's not working right now, but it makes it much, much easier for them to input that kind of data without having to have a programmer thought of, oh, use this pipe character to, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Node Connect is a phenomenal module, and what it does is it makes node references usable. Um, I can show you a quick one of these. Uh, anybody use node references in here? And the really hard thing is, is when you're creating that content, if you don't have the node to reference to, it's really hard to, to connect them up. You've got to create the reference node first, and then you've got to go back and create the node you want to reference to it. Not so with Node Connect. Yeah. This is on our app server, which I know there's some good stuff in here. Um, So if I go to create an app on our app server, if you notice, there's uh, dependencies and libraries down here. These are node references. Well, if I want to add one, there's this nice little plus button over here. And when I click that, it takes me to create a dependency. What's that? Eventually? Do what? Yeah. Really, you might want to just try editing an existing app. Okay. Server is going a little slow at the moment. Oh, there it goes. Uh, I did, did get disconnected. Connection's been kind of going up and down. Oh, it's up. That might be it. Hey. So I need to do some performance tuning on this server. Apparently. OK, we're not going to wait for that one. What it happens is when you hit that plus button, it takes you to the node screen for whatever dependency you're adding. You fill it out and hit Save, and it takes you back to the previous form and, and populates that node reference field for you. So you can very quickly add all of your node references right, from, right in there, and it just takes you back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. This is a problem that we've been trying to solve for probably four years in Drupal and haven't success, successfully been able to do it. But now with, uh, with that one, we can. So it's very cool. This last one, WebForm Alt UI. Uh, does anybody have a problem with WebForm? Anybody used it? Anybody used it? It's pretty good. Um, WebForm Alt UI, if you've ever used uh, Drupal Gardens, has an incredible UI on top of it that uh, is made in this module. Now, caveat, massive, massive caveat. It's under major development. Uh, you're, if, you don't, if you're not comfortable with patches and lots of patches, this is not ready for you yet. Um, but hopefully in the next few months, they'll get it ready. Uh, but what it is is it's, it's a new UI for web form that makes it much, much easier to create. So then when you have a marketing person that's creating a survey form or a contact form or something like that, it's much easier for them to create it. It's more like, it works more like, um, MailChimp does, or SurveyMonkey, where it's all drag and drop and easy to configure, as opposed to the Drupal way, which is programmer-centric again. So, um, Here's the fun part. Don't use panels or context. What's that? I just, I just said, oh, wow. Really? 
Yes. Um, why? Well, most people would understand panels because end users, it, anytime they're configuring panels, it's very, very confusing. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more why not to use panels later, but context might be a little surprising. The problem is context is really great if you think like a programmer. If these conditions are true, then do this thing on the site, right? Um, and, and I should say context for placing blocks, really. Um, Every time we've used context and then handed it over to our clients to manage it, they get really confused. They go, why can't I get rid of this block? Oh, it's because it's in a context. And they open up context and go, ha! <laughs> right? And that's not what we want to have to happen. It turns out there's a really good system for managing blocks. And it's called the block system in core. And what we found is clients are really, really comfortable with it. They're OK with copying 30 URLs and pasting it into a, a, a box. They understand that. They're comfortable with it. What they can't figure out is context or panels. right? So what we recommend now and what we've been doing is use blocks. And use only blocks, unless you're doing like little footer things or something that they're never going to want to change. And that has worked incredibly well. So I want to highly recommend that. Yes? So the question is, if you have about 30 URLs, does that make it slower? The answer really is no. The way that the program works in the back end is um, there is a regex that's run against it. So you, there's a function you call. You pass it the value from the, the long list, which ends up being one string. You pass it what URL or what page URL you're on, and it does a regex and says yes, no. And so it's just the speed of a regex, which is pretty fast. So it's, it's not like it's running a longer and longer loop or anything like that. It's, it's pretty quick. Um, it, it's, there's, no, there's negligible performance impact on it. Yes, sir. Yes. These are not performance modules. Um, anytime you add a module to your site, you're decreasing performance. Um, there is always a performance hit because there's, there's hooks that have to get checked for. There's all kinds of stuff that goes on. Um, so the more modules you have, the worse your site will perform. Ask Travis. <laughs> but um, really what we're talking about, it, in, in these, these are relatively simple modules. So besides the minimum performance impact that any module has on your site, they're not going to be major performance hogs in other ways. More than likely, there's a lot of other things you can do to improve performance before you, you would even need to think about turning these off. So I wouldn't worry about, about it too much. Um, I would more focus on making it so people can use it, because making a site that's unusable by your employees is going to be kill your site much faster than um, minor performance differences. So, All right. So. Uh, we use the block system, as funny as that is. But um, actually, in Drupal 7, uh, it's nice they've added you can send blocks by content type now, which is a huge improvement. Before, you had to do that by nasty PHP statements. So uh, that's a huge improvement. So the next thing we're going to talk about is consistency. We need to make sure that they, as people are managing this site, it's always consistent. Um, and this is another reason why uh, we'll get to that. Every page on the site should have a, 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 the same way of updating it, changing it, making modifications to it. Images and text should be attached and updated in a single interface. Um, and use the best, easiest tools for content generation. One of the things we always ran into was um, we, we, when we get the wireframes and the comps back and we start building the site, we go, oh, this page is a list of products, so let's make this a view page. Right? That's what we do. And then we go, oh, this page is, uh, it has a bunch of tables and crazy layout. Let's make this a panel page because it makes it easy to, to uh, put different content in different areas, right? And oh, this is just a simple text page. Let's make it a node, okay? So then what happens? Our client gets to the pages and he goes to the products page and he wants to make a change. Or he says, I want some text at the top. And he hits the edit button and sees the views interface. And panics, right? 
And then he goes to the panels page and goes, oh, I want to change this little text down here and hits edit. And he sees the panels interface and goes, ah, right? This is what happened with us time and again and it confused our clients to no end. So what we decided was, we got to figure this out. Make every page a node. Again, radical concept. Use the block system. Use the node system. You know, and, and the first site we did this on, it was amazing how many more things worked because everything was a node. The menu system worked. The block system worked. Everything worked when we're not trying to shove all these other things in there. So the question comes, how do you put your views and the other stuff in there? Glad you asked. Use some other modules. They're called the view field or view reference. These are kind of, they're, they're similar modules. I've used view reference. But view field is another one that do the exact same thing, which is they create a field on your node where you can attach views to them. All right? There's also block reference and table field, which if you have a block on your site and you want to put it at the bottom of your content, you just do it. I'm going to show you guys this in just a second. Um, table field, if you have a bunch of tabular data that you want in your content, you can do that inside of a field. You're, but it's still a node, and that's the beauty of it is it's always a node. Yes? Yes, these are all modules. View reference, view field, block reference, and table field are all modules on Drupal.org. They're great. I highly recommend them. So, uh, oh, and so I also use the menu system. Like I said, it's amazing when everything is a node, the menu system works. You no longer have all these crazinesses that comes with panels and views and the nightmare that comes with that. Everything just kind of works. So let's take a look at one of our client websites that we've done this on and kind of see what happened. So here we have um, a normal product page that has a quick tab down below. How, how would normally we have, how, how could we have built this? Ideas? Sorry? References? All kinds of references all over the place? What? Use a view, yeah. Well, here's what we did. It's a node, right? There's the Our Products page, which is a node. If you look at the top, there's a View, Edit, and Node Queue. And then Develop, because we have it turned on. So how did we get all this stuff in there? Obviously, that could be a node. You got the title, you got a little bit of content, and then you got all this stuff down here. Well, to make it easy for our clients to manage, there's the body, right? Pretty simple, there's the title. And then down here we have, you can either attach a view, and here's your view arguments, or you can have attach a block. And in this case, we've created a quick tab block, and it's called the product slider tabs. So all that they have to do, if they want to put this anywhere else on the site, is create a page and go into this complex little drop down and say, here's what I want on the bottom. And it's there. Much, much more simple, right? Say they wanted a view. Well, I've created some views on the site, and I say, what do you want at the bottom? Do you want the products block? Do you want a full products listing? Do you want the shop online block? Do you want a view? Do you want the package inserts view? And it's very easy for them to figure out what they want where. This, this is the view reference module, yeah. So all we did was create the views and then I, I always do this on my basic page inside of my fields. Oops is and by the way this has gone over very this is the stuff that I'm talking about that's gone over very very well we just create some content and then we show them how to modify the nodes um, and they can figure it out this helps because a lot of our um, clients now want hero images at the top so we just make that a node field and they can put it in there and add whatever else they want at the bottom so inside of here if you notice, I've got um, the title body like normal, then I've got my attached view and my attached block. So I've created two new fields that allow them to attach whatever they want to every node that they're on. Now, um, the other one was, so we, that's view reference and block reference. And again, view field does the exact same thing. Um, and then table field is another one where if you want tabular data, you can do the exact same thing with it. And it works really, really well. Why, when you say view field and view reference is the exact same thing, so which one's better, which one should you use? 
Neither of them are better or worse at the same time. At this time, they're talking about combining into one. It's two guys had the exact same idea, wrote the module at the exact same time, and released them. And now we're trying to combine them together. I've used View Reference, and I really liked it. Um, view Field, I think, has a better name. If that counts for anything, and uh, and from what I read in the comment queue, it it uh, does a very good job, and maybe does some things that are slightly easier way, but they do essentially the same thing, which is admit, give you the drop-down list and say, show the contents of this view. So um, let me show you some other places where we did this. So in this client site under, let's see, we've got women's health, urology, pediatrics, and dermatology, right? So each of these pages is a view but what's really interesting about this is they're the same view, which is the products block, and I just pass it an argument, which is women's health. And that's a taxonomy term, and it just filters the products listing by the taxonomy term. So all I had to do, so say they have a new content type. All, what do they have to do to add it? They create a new vocabulary, or a new taxonomy term, and then node add a new page, put whatever content they want, add the products block, and put that taxonomy term in there. Done. That's it. That's all they had to do. Very, very simple for them, so they can manage it. Um, correct. Well, so I created that view, and I created the view in such a way that it expects an argument to filter the results. And so all you have to do is, because I've created that way, the marketing people can go in there and just put whatever they want to filter by and it'll filter it all out and show it on that page. So on that, on that specific page, we're filtering by women's health products because um, it's called the women's health page and now we just see all of their items that are tagged for women's health. Now urology, is, um, is going to be the exact same view but it's going to have urology instead of women's health in there. So, and actually, that, that, that specific use case happened to us when we were about to launch. They go, oh, we really need a dermatology section. So it, and they're like, how many more hours to do that? And I was like, 15 minutes, right? Because I just went click, 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 and done. I, because of the way I built it this way, it really was very simple to do. Um, so that's kind of the consistency standpoint where they know exactly what to expect. Uh, expect. Every single page on the website has an edit, edit tab where they can hit edit and they can affect the layout of the page. If a third of your pages are panels and a third of yours are views and a third of them are nodes, there is no consistency there and you're going to confuse the heck out of them. So we've kind of gone to this model and it's worked extremely well. Um, a couple of notes. <clears throat> First of all, there's this module called Display Suite. I don't know if any of you guys have looked at it it's kind of panels done right. Okay? So if you want the power of panels, which, which to a certain extent is being able to put stuff in like left and right columns and different things like that, it can do that, but it doesn't add some of the crazy stuff that panels does. Um, and also, there are cases where you need to use view pages still. I've run into those cases where we just kind of have to have view pages from time to time. Specifically, if, you are, if it's like the... Um, blog aggregator page and you want to be able to filter by arguments and all down, you still do need to have a view. The arguments don't pass terribly well down into nodes. Um, the, there's very, very minor um, cases where with view pages I have had to do it. Um, I just could not get it to work with uh, view reference. So, um, but for the vast majority of times when we do use views, don't. If you're not using complex arguments with, with uh, previous next filters and all that kind of stuff, you don't need it. Make it a node with a view attachment. All right? Standard stuff. Yes, sir? Um, that one that I was just looking at? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's missionpharmacal.com. Interested in some of the products? <laughs> Um, display suite. It's it's shortened DS, so Drupal.org slash project slash DS. 
Um, I haven't actually used it yet, but from the videos that I've seen and, and the little stuff, it looks really cool. Um, I may start using it. I haven't totally evaluated it, but that's a freebie in case you want to play with it. Uh, next issue we're going to deal with is some standard stuff. This is kind of the stuff that rankles me a little bit, but it's absolutely true. Use modules for what they were intended. Don't try and stretch them too far. This was, uh, we were really bad about this with organic groups in Drupal 6. Right, Travis? <laughs> Use, and, and we do it with taxonomy, too. We try to make taxonomy a menu system. No, make it a taxonomy system and stick with that, right? Um, if we stick with the way things are meant to be used, it works really great. Now, again, this is really geared, this talk is geared towards people who are making usually company or organization type websites and trying to do marketing. And we're trying to hand them over to marketing people. If you're trying to build a product with Drupal, it's a whole different ball game, right? This is really geared around making simple websites for marketing people. Okay, so this is very important though. Once we start go doing crazy things with modules, getting crazy with nodes, getting crazy with taxonomy, getting crazy with menu, it confuses people, all right? Uh, keep things as flat as possible. Don't make complex link structures. Don't make references that reference something else, that reference something else. And, oh, we need um, a building which has an address, which is a separate content type, which has, you know, this and it has that. And you go crazy because you're going to go mad. And it's going to be really, really hard to input the data because you're going to be 20 levels deep of add this, add this, add this, and you're going to forget where you are, right? Yes, ma'am. So the question was, how does this affect anything when you're being indexed? <clears throat> the answer is not really at all. Uh, I mean, these are all does, these aren't really SEO principles. These are kind of how to make it easy principles. Um, all of these, when we do a lot of SEO work, uh, we we always try to make our sites as SEO friendly as we possibly can. So all of these are completely compatible with SEO strategies as well. Uh, in fact, they may actually help them a bit. Um, but what I mean by keeping it as flat as possible is, it's okay to make a product content type and a solution content type and um, a blog content type and whatnot, but just don't try and get crazy linking them all over together using node references and user references. You're going to go mad. With your end user is going to go mad is what's going to happen, right? Um, it's okay um, like, uh, like Mission has where they have products or they have um, they have uh, like several different types. Uh, we have another client that has challenges, solutions, and products, and industries, and they are trying to link them together. And I'm trying to push them back and say, look, we need as few links as possible. Let's make this as simple as possible so you guys can manage it, and it makes sense. Um, so that's what I mean by that. Don't make it a flat website, but make it, don't get your node types crazy interlinked, because it, you will go mad. Uh, so, what, so specifically, use taxonomy for taxonomy. I mean, isn't this a radical talk? Use nodes for nodes. Use blocks for blocks. Use menu for menus. And use taxonomy. It's crazy concepts, I know. But we've gotten so far away from it, it's kind of like a, a grounding lesson. Um, <clears throat> use node user references sparingly. No more than one deep kind of is my rule. If you're going more than one deep, you got a problem. You need to re... Rethink your uh, data structure. When you solve a problem, do it in such a way that you can contribute it to Drupal.org. Don't make hacky modules. Generally, in our, when we're de developing something for a client, we create some features, and, and everything goes into the feature. If we need additional functionality beyond that, we create a module and we contribute it to Drupal.org. Like I was saying, we did this on Wednesday and Thursday, and we put it on Drupal.org. The problem that we had was we needed a mega menu, one of those things where you hover over the menu and it shows big um, icons with text and whatnot. And we discussed all the other ways of doing it, like embedding a view using a menu alter in the theme layer or all these crazy ways of doing it, like I've done other places. Um, didn't like any of those because they're really, really hacky. We thought, and suddenly something popped into my head. Why don't we allow people to attach views into menus using a simple UI? So that's what we did. We created the menu views module, and it's on Drupal.org.
And basically what it does is it allows you, like I said, to create a view and attach it into a menu. Now all you do is you, you create your view and you attach it. That's it. Now, um, what site did we do that for? HMSC. HMSC. So let's take a look at what that ended up looking like. Uh, this first one is our mega menu. So this is actually a view. And as I roll down over it, these are views as well. They're all just in my menu. So anything now you can do in a view, you can slap into a menu. So, so um, let's see if it's still a default password. Ah. Oh, yeah. So, so what does it look like? If you notice right there, it says attached view is the challenges related resources mega menu. So all you have to do to add one is you can put your node path in, select your view, select the display, and pass in any arguments you want. And now that view will show up inside of your menu system. This is a really, really great way. I mean, this is non-hacky, right? This, it's really, really simple code, but it's non-hacky. We did it in such a way that we can contribute it back, and I think it's going to get pretty popular because it's really cool. What if you wanted to have a list of the most recent blog posts in your menu? How do you do that traditionally? It's really hard. Now it's as simple as create the menu link, give it a title and a path, and you can put view right here if you don't really want a path. And then select the view, select the display, click Save. That's it. It's now in there. So this, this requires the views, the views module and then this, it just adds functionality? This does require the views module, yes. This adds functionality to the menu system. So now you can embed views inside your menu. But this is a great example of, we were thinking through all the hacky ways to do it, and we said, no, we don't want to be hacky. We want to do this the right way. And we thought it through. And we realized we can write a module, contribute to Drupal.org. Yes, Alan? How often these days do you build out a site for the client and not write a custom site specific module? So the question was, how often do we make a client site and not write a, uh, um, a, custom, module. a custom module? One-off custom module for that site. Uh, and, and how often do we not write a one-off custom module for them? I would say if you don't include features, most of our sites are that way now. Um, features allow us to do a lot of the customizations that we need to do. You can include it right in the features module. Um, rarely do we make a custom module anymore. Um, everything we do as policy, we try and do it in, in, where we don't do custom modules for the client anymore. We either do something like this or we put it into a feature. So. And let me tell you, maintainability long term, now we've got people looking at this code. Now we've got people using this code, re reporting bugs. And so we're going to be able to fix, we're going to be able to support our client much, much better in the future. So uh, don't do things that are cool or crazy. Hey, check out what I did. I made it so that if you click here and do this and do that, it does this really cool thing. Every time I hear that, I cringe because... I mean, unless it's like, hey, I made something really simple and I put it on Drupal.org, it's usually going to be something really hacky and, and bad. So don't do that. <clears throat> and finally, talk clients out of doing things that are too complex. It's amazing how uh, you know I've really started pushing back on a lot of our clients. They'll say, oh, well, I want to integrate um, this one application that we have that we can do blog posts to into our Drupal site so that they share uh, blog posts between them. And, I, and I'm like, OK. Well, that doesn't really have an API, so the integration is probably going to cost you know thirty, forty thousand dollars to get all those things talking. It's going to be custom code, and it's going to break a lot, and you're going to be constantly fixing it. How often do you post blog posts? Oh, once every week or two. Okay. Do you want to pay somebody barely above minimum wage to take an extra thirty minutes to post to both places, or do you want to spend thirty thousand dollars to do this integration? They go, oh, well, <laughs> let's just have them do the double duty, right? You know, my thing is if you're not doing it hundreds of times a day, don't automate it, right? If you're doing it once a week, don't automate it. You don't really need to. So, but in, in, beyond that, though, 
a lot of our clients come in and they're like, we need this really complex data structure where this links to that and that links to this and this is here and that's there. And, we, and we, when we go through our, our uh, discovery process and talk through what they really need and figure it all out and then we gel it all down and we go, well, you really don't need that. Well, here's what you need. It's very simple. You're going to be able to remember it. People are going to be able to manage it and it works really well. So talk clients out of complexity is uh, my final thing. So that's kind of some of the stuff we come down to. Um, I want to give a special thanks for a lot of the stuff to um, Acquia, specifically Drupal Gardens. They really pioneered a lot of this um, usability improvements that we're seeing. Uh, the Views 3 rewrite was done specifically for Drupal, uh, Drupal Gardens. Anybody use that? Fantastic rewrite. I love it. Uh, much, much simpler, easier to understand. They've rearranged everything beautifully. Um, a lot of those um, back ports and different things come from Drupal.org. Um, it's just an overall really great, uh, they've done a really great job at simplifying things. The, the web form alt UI comes from them. So I'm really hoping we get more and more of that stuff into the community where we can really make things easier to use in the future. Um, also, a quick plug for us. Um, a lot of the things, up, practically everything in here that I've talked about, we've done in our distribution, which is called Open Enterprise. So if you want all this stuff all bundled together, ready to go, just go get Open Enterprise. It's already in there, including other goodies like apps, which I've talked about in the past and, and different things. So uh, it just makes it really easy to, to get a hold of. Uh, any more questions? I've answered an awful lot of questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the question was, do we have a list of clients that have said it's okay to share? Um, yeah, um, on our website, we've got a we've got a portfolio of all of our work. Um, so if you go to our work, you'll see some of the last ones we did. We actually just launched Tektronix Communications on Friday, so that one it's not even up here yet. Um, there's Health Market Science. The previous version we did, this is the new version that we're working on right now. It's all ready to go up. Um, we, did, we did the Kimball Art Museum's Caravaggio. We're about to do their main website. We're doing a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So, um, and then if you click on uh, View More Projects, it's got a whole other list of stuff that we've worked on. So there's lots and lots and lots of them. Um, yeah, all pretty for you too. Uh, gateway Worship, we did that one. We have any Gateway people? I don't think they made it today. What's that? Okay. No, not all of them are Drupal 7. Uh, some of these go back in time a ways. Um, everything that we do from now on is Drupal 7, but um, there we still have a lot of clients that we've had for years, and they have a Drupal 6 site, and they're not ready to go yet. So um, we're still doing working on that. Do you have Ajax modules? Ajax modules. Do we have Ajax modules? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. What if it's a web database application? So they've got a database. Uh, I'm a Java back end and JavaScript front end guy, yeah, and we have, uh, well, there's a lot of Ajax and all that. Updating databases automatically from the forms, mm -hmm. things like that. Drupal has a lot of built in Ajax capabilities. Um, it comes with jQuery, so all of the magic of jQuery is in there. Uh, the form API has built-in Ajax where you can very easily say make if this is changed change this value like you saw in the views form if I change the views the displays view changes all that's very very simple to do all the Ajax stuff's already built and in, baked into Drupal so all that stuff's um, very nice so it has a lot of Ajax stuff any other questions yes, sir Sure. Um, I did like your portion of the lecture where you talked about consistency and references. I really appreciate that. Uh, but going beyond that, have you ever checked out the relation and it becomes even more complex, the relation module? Um, I just wanted to see your take on that. So the question was, have we ever checked out the relation module? Um, I th it, was that in Drupal 6? Okay, so the relation module. I haven't checked it out a whole lot. Travis, do you have a lot of experience with the relation module yet? Um, 
I haven't used it a whole lot yet. Um, I really haven't had a use case for it yet. Sure. Anybody built a, uh, a wiki application? We're looking for one with a product we're rolling out. Question is, anybody built a wiki application? Yeah, all of the tools are in Drupal. I think there might be a wiki module that even adds ex uh, additional functionality. But um, with all of the stuff in core, you can more or less do it. Uh, there, there should be some write-ups. If not, just uh, post some questions around, and, and people will help you through it. It's, it's not it, with Drupal. It's very simple to do. There used to be a wiki recipe. We actually have it on our website. We used to have it in the older versions of Open Enterprise for Drupal six. There are a few specialty things like you know double brackets and do free linking and you know and all and like so like if you free link it and the page doesn't exist, it says hey this node doesn't exist. You want to create it? Um, there's a little stuff like that in like Markdown and so forth. So it's more of a recipe. It's it's yeah. There are there are like he's saying. There's a lot of recipes to do it. Um, Drupal provides all of the tools you need to get it done. You just got to know how to do it. It's not one of those out of the box check here and it's there. So, any other questions? The back ports. Well, so the backports module, what it does is it takes some of the usability or the, the inter interface improvements they did for Drupal 6 and brings it back to Dru or Drupal 8 and brings it back to Drupal 7. So some of the improvements that they're making, now it used to do a lot more, but as I'm looking over it, it doesn't do as much as I thought it did. Um, but it's still pretty cool to have. It adds some additional form elements, uh, like a lot of the HTML5 items are now in there and different things like that. So. Um, the idea, I'm hoping more and more stuff gets in there as they do th things in Drupal 8, because they can't change Drupal 7 right now. So they're putting it in Drupal 8, but like they did with a lot of things in Drupal 6, they've got the backports module to pull those back in case you actually want them. So. I noticed on um, adding the content, some of those icons, um, were they adding a basic page, adding a login page? Is that part of the, uh, So the question is, on the adding content to different things, there was different icons in there. Um, these right here, I believe those are part of the Rubik Tau theme. That's what I'm saying. Get that theme if you're not using it. So, so Rubik Tau is one theme? It's, not it's two two themes. themes. How do you use, is one an admin theme and one's a... Uh, no, theme? one's a parent, one's a... Rubik relies on Tau. Yeah, Rubik relies on Tau. So Tau is kind of like a, a base theme. And then Rubik is a sub-theme of Tau. So you actually set it to Rubik, but you have to download both of them. And do you have a recommendation for a user theme? That a front-end theme? Front end theme yeah. Omega. Omega. Yeah. Um, Omega does not come with colors or prettiness at all, but it is by far the best framework I've seen for creating a, um, a front-end user theme. Anybody disagree with that? It does have a steep learning curve, but it's so flexible you, can do you can do anything with it. It's not that bad. I, you know, I put, I put it, I'm not a themer, and I put together my own theme in it really quick, and it was very nice. What you get with it is amazing. So, if you don't want to have to think very much about it, stick with Bartik. It's a great theme out of the box. Bartik? It's the default one. It's... Um, it's this theme right here. Change some colors up. Maybe tweak the CSS a little. If you really are not comfortable with theming, I'd stick with Bartik. If you really want to make a great theme and you know a little bit about it, use Omega. Marinelli, yeah, though they're kind of old. You don't really want to use that one. Omega's HTML5. It's responsive. Um, I mean, yeah, so this is what I mean by that. If you go to, let me log out just so it's extra fun. So say you view this on a narrower screen. It gets narrower. Uh, what if you're on a, um, an iPad? Ta-da. What happens if you're on a mobile phone? You know, so no matter what size of a screen you've got, 
it adjusts itself to fit accordingly. So that's kind of some of the bonus stuff you get with Omega that you don't get out of Bartik. So, so you, you want mobile apps definitely. Not mobile apps, mobile friendly, responsive. Oh, okay. So this is this is just a website. You know, sorry, not mobile apps. Mobile yeah. Mobile friendly. So people can see the site on their mobile device. Correct. Omega is the way to go. Bartik doesn't give you that. Hopefully, I, th I think in Drupal 8, the base thing that they're going to work on is going to be this type of responsive. It's going to be HTML5 responsive, all that. But uh, Drupal 7 is not. So, yes, ma'am. A Drupal 8? Um, officially, it's what, 18 months from when Dries feels like Drupal 7 is established, which is not yet. So. It's at least 18 months away. I would say probably closer to two years. I heard code freeze is supposed to be summer of 2013. Yeah, so that's. Code further along than two years. Well, hopefully the code freeze won't be a year and a half like it was for Drupal 7. <laughs> It, it was the migration path. It was all the tests getting in there, usability. It, it was not, there was 600 bugs, whereas they're keeping it under 15 this time. So, um, And using the different uh, Git um, branches should drastically improve that situation. Although if Larry Garfield has his way, it, <laughs> it could be a, a massive rewrite anyways. So. Drupal, Drupal 8. Yeah, if, if they accomplish what they want to accomplish for Drupal 8, it is going to be absolutely amazing. Um, the question is if. Problem, and I really hope they do. It will. The user's going to look at it and be like, oh, okay, it's just Drupal. Yeah, that's true, but it will be awesome. It will be awesome. Yeah. Help you guys a lot. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, or are we about to ready to wrap? All right. Thank you guys very much. Um, this was this is my first time with this presentation. And I threw it together this afternoon, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how it's going, and hopefully I'm going to give it at some camps and stuff if you guys liked it. So um, it's a topic I like. So thanks. <laughs>